And here you thought we'd be taking a break because of All-Star break, but quite the opposite is true. We're going to talk about Oliver Bjorkstrand, who is doing pretty well and has been hot for a while before his injury as well. He has 11 points in his last six games. He has seriously turned it on. And we tweeted about it last night. We said Oliver Bjorkstrand is an absolute beauty. And a lot of people replied. People were really hyped. The tweet did really well. And a lot of people had one question more than any other. Is he the real deal? And so I think that's what we want to address today. Is Oliver Bjorkstrand, and perhaps more importantly, this Oliver Bjorkstrand actually for real. And also, I think the important thing with guys like Bjorkstrand, which we talk about a lot on Hot Hands and, and other types of shows like these, or when we do like Unsustainable and whatnot, one of the big question marks are what are the pivot points for someone to be doing well, or what are the pivot points for someone to stop doing well, right? When you look at someone like Vrana, for example, it's minutes and shots on goal. And, and Kubalik is goals alone. If, if he stops scoring goals, he's pretty much not worth it anymore. So every player has these own pivot points of where can they get better or where can they get worse? They, they all have these these little places that you should be keeping an eye on and Bjorkstrand has some very very obvious ones now before we get into the show really quick uh, if you haven't already be sure to subscribe to the channel for more fantasy hockey videos we put out stuff all the time and also if you're not already uh consider becoming a youtube member and supporting us you get episodes before anybody else you get a special discord channel to talk to us and a bunch of other perks so be sure to check that out down below there's a little button that says join or you can find it in the description so let's start off now with oliver Bjorkstrand. What's going on? So he has been killing. Who is he, though? He's a sniper, first and foremost. He is a goal scorer. He is known for his sniping ability. When he was coming up as a prospect, everyone loved his shot. And when you watch his games, that's the most impressive thing about Oliver Bjorkstrand. It's his release. It's just so fast off his stick. And it's pretty deceiving as well to goaltenders. When you watch the goal against Winnipeg, which I'll put up here if you're watching the video, and when you watch that game-winning goal against Winnipeg, something really interesting happens. He drives the net, which he used to not do, actually. He didn't play a very physical game. So that's a new element to his game as well, that he's playing more physical, especially physical, especially up along the boards, which is helping his play a lot because that allows him to get past players and get towards the middle. So on this goal against Winnipeg, he comes in, he, he fakes, he holds it on a stick for the longest time. And it what seems like an easy shot in an angle where a puck shouldn't go in he finds a way in. And Laurent Brassois is actually confused. He has no idea how the puck just slipped through him. And this is just a thing of Oliver Bjorkstrand. You watch his goals against the Rangers in his first game back, and that's this is who he is. He's a guy with a wicked, wicked release, and he has since he was young. This is when he was coming up, like I said, through the system. This is what everyone lauded about Oliver Bjorkstrand, that he is an impressive as hell shooter. He's an, an, a very, very impressive sniper. For the context of... Uh, the Columbus Blue Jackets, I think you could almost compare him to a younger, better Cam Atkinson at the moment. And in a way, they're using him very, very similarly. So let's take a look, of course, first. Deployment. Where in the world is Oliver Bjorkstrand playing right now? So he's playing right now on the top line with Pierre-Luc Dubois and Gustav Nyquist. Not a terrible line. I actually like that line quite a bit. And him and Dubois have had some chemistry as of late. So this is actually a positive for Dubois as well. Cam Atkinson gets pushed down to that second line with Alexander Wemberg and uh, Emil Bemstrom. And then he's on the top power play. So this is bad news bears for Cam Atkinson, especially, who is now on that second power play, which... It's just not very good, in my opinion. Nick Foligno, Alexander Wenberg, Emil Bemstrom, and Seth Jones. Not a terrible power play unit, but not a great one either. That top one, in my opinion, is far, far better with Boone Jenner, Pierre-Luc Dubois, Wierenski, and Nyquist. And especially if you listen to the podcast, you know this, that we're fans of players when they get to play with the same line on the power play. So in this case... That Nyquist, uh, Dubois, and Bjorkstrand chemistry gets to continue all the way to the power play. And they're doing that as well on the second power play unit. And this is also just a thing that Torts tends to do. Uh, he did this before with the Rangers as well, and he did it in Vancouver. Um, I'm a big proponent of this. I love when teams keep their lines together on the power play. It just continues that chemistry. And if we take a look at the last game line, so this is the one against Winnipeg, you see that Bjorkstrand played with uh, Dubois and Felino, and that was 30.4% of the game that line was out. So a very clear top line that they have. And then that second line played 24% of the game. The third line played 21.6% of the game. Um, and one of the big differences... 
there actually that we see to uh, what we saw in Daily Faceoff is that in that last game, something that they changed up was that Nick Felino actually came up to the top line. So instead of it being Gustav Nyquist on the top line, for the last game, Nick Felino was on the top line with Bjorkstrand Dubois. And on that second line, uh, Nyquist moved down and was playing with Atkinson and Wenberg. Now, both of the lines did actually really well from a Corsi 4 percentage perspective. Uh, the second line was actually better, uh, but they both were really solid. And when you look at the power play opportunities, they didn't have many power play opportunities. So they only had two Corsi 4 opportunities, so only two shot attempts on a power play. So Bjorkstrand, Dubois, and Jenner, and Nyquist played the majority of that, but that's not all that important there. All the, the again, what is important here is that this spells disaster for Cam Atkinson. If, if he's not top power play and not second line, there's just not a lot you can do to help the guy. Now this, before we get into the stats, I wanted to show you this really quick from Hockey Biz because it's really, really interesting. So this is Bjorkstrand's uh, point rates, ice time, and kind of just obviously the team. He's obviously on the Blue Jackets forever. So the most important thing here to look at is these pink lines here. If you're on um, HockeyViz.com, he shows you kind of what their time on ice has been over the course of their career. And so you can look here on, if you're on the video, uh, it says line ice time here, first, second, third, fourth. And where this black line is, is what kind of they're playing. And if you look at his career, he's always been played as a third line and fourth line guy. That's, that's pretty much where he's been. Last year, he was pretty much always a third line or fourth line guy. And that's showed by his minutes. This is the first year where he's really started to get into that second line range and almost touching that top line. And what's interesting too, is that when you look at last year, so the top bit here that I'm looking at on this point rates, ice time and team is the primary points per hour. So it's essentially primary points per 60, the easy way to say that. And last year at the tail end, he did incredible for the season. I mean, last year, and people forget about this a little bit, but Last year, he played really, really well for the second half of the season. He he was really, really impressive. And I've always liked Bjorkstra, and I traded for him in Dynasty in the offseason because I've really liked him. I mean, he always turned into a gem and be a GM mode on uh, the NHL games. But in real life, he's pretty damn good, too. And last year, he was good. And, and this is another interesting thing. When you look at his isolated impact, how, how much offense does he drive? He adds plus 14% relative to league average. And he's actually really good defensively as well. And so it almost begs to question why. Why in the world has Bjorkstrand not been getting these minutes before? And this is why, and, and then you uh, scroll down here to historical isolated impact. So what is this telling us? It's telling us what's his impact over the different seasons, uh, over his career. And if you look at it, he's been really good, but he's taken a big step forward in these past two years. Last year, 2018-2019, he was plus 9.1% relative to league average on offense. This year, he's plus 13.9% on offense relative to league average. And on defense, he's gotten even better. Last year, he reduced uh, offensive threat on defense while he was on defense by negative 8.2% relative to league average. This year, he's at negative 17.6%. This is isolated impact. So this is Hockey Viz trying to tell you at five on five, what is Bjorkstrand himself do? Forget about the whole team. How does the whole team play? This is how does he affect play? And, and this is his attempt to try to understand that. And one thing that's really impressive is his defense. He's so good on defense. And that's why you see his offensive zone starts actually aren't very high. They're around the 50 mark. And, and that's because he's so good on defense as well that you can kind of start him wherever and it doesn't really matter. And so when you look at a guy like Bjorkstrand, you remember back to when I was talking about Kubalik, I think that's the, that's the one where I was talking about this. Well, when you look at a guy like Kubalik and you say, okay, well, he's kind of playing in this 15 minute mark, right? Well, can, is he deserving of more minutes? And the one place that you can point to and say that a guy deserves more minutes is, is he good on the defensive side of the puck as well? Uh, if he is, then yeah, okay, we can probably start to see him more minutes because they can put him in more opportunities. Kubalik wasn't that. Whereas when you look at Bjorkstrand here, he's so good on defense. Y you gotta wonder why he's not getting more minutes to begin with. He should just be getting more minutes in general um, because you can put him out there pretty much any time and he's good. It doesn't matter if you're in the defensive zone, if you're up, if you're down, it really doesn't matter because he's really good uh, in general. And, and so Bjorkstrand deserves these extra minutes. And when we look at his actual time on ice, so now we go over to the stats. This season, he's averaging just about 17 and a half minutes a game. Last year, he was sitting at just under 12 and a half minutes per game. That's a huge, huge difference for a guy like Oliver Bjorkstrand. And the interesting thing is that his shots per 60 actually aren't that different from last this year to last year, but his shot pace has changed dramatically. When you look at his shot pace from last year, it was 171, which is, again, just a big 
big reason of that is just ice time. If you're not on the ice for very long and you're also good defensively, so that means you're going to be put into not simply offensive uh, opportunities. You're going to be put into all kinds of opportunities. You just can't shoot as much. This year, he's on a 283 shot pace and shooting even more since he came back from injury. And so when you look at Bjorkstrand, he's a big time on ice guy. When he gets time on ice, he makes it count. And so that's one of these pivots that I was talking about with a guy, uh, with any player like this, is the minutes are what matter. If at some point you see Bjorkstrand's minutes start to fall off, then in that case, well, he's not going to be as worth it. Simple as that. The most impressive thing, though, is that even with less than 12 and a half minutes a game last year, he scored 23 goals. Yep, with a 14.3% shooting. That is real real impressive because that shooting percentage actually isn't that crazy for the type of player that Bjorkstrand is. And he scored 23 goals playing, like I said, 12 and a half minutes a game, less than 12 and a half minutes per game. On top of that, both this season and last season, his IPP right in line, his IPP this year is actually identical to last year. Amazing to see from him. And he's doing it with almost exactly the same on ice shooting percentage. Everything for Bjorkstrand to me looks intact and looks good. There's his team power play percentage is up uh, everything to me just looks so damn good and look at this look how impressive this is too his on ice save percentage almost exactly the same from last year he's playing like like hockey is saying right kind of uh proves that point out a little bit that yeah he's good on defense he makes the team better um everything to me about bjorkstrand just paints such a pretty picture we can take a look at um frozen pool here what do they say about the advanced stats as well? And the Corsi 4 percentage is still high compared to, uh, he's been getting better every single year, his Corsi 4 percentage, uh, except for 2016-2017 when he really didn't play many minutes, so I, I wouldn't really say much there. Uh, but his Corsi 4 percentage there was kind of his all-time high. He went down a little bit 2017-2018, down a little bit 2018, or up a little bit 2018-2019, then went up again this year. So he's taking strides every year and getting better, and part of that is the system as well. But... But he himself has been doing really well. His IPP is solid. Like I said, his power play percentage has gone up. His points per 60 are pretty much in line, which is actually a good thing. If the points per 60 were up by a crazy amount, I'd actually be a little bit worried that it's going to come down. Uh, but the points per 60 being really similar to last year is a really good thing. And the crazy thing here, too, is that if we look at his 5 on 5 shooting percentage, his 5 on 5 shooting percentage, 8.6%, is pretty much the same as last year. He's He is the last year's player. Who was, mind you, remember, this is why when people ask us, oh my God, is he real? Why are you guys touting him as this good player? He was good last year. The reason he couldn't reach incredible numbers and be fantasy relevant was simply ice time. He didn't get the minutes to continue doing what he was doing. And now he's getting the minutes and continuing to be as good as he was last year and allowing him to become this super fantasy relevant player. So to me, Al, Al, Oliver Bjorkstrand is a guy that uh, you can see here the power play time, time on ice is uh, nearly doubled here. His time on ice, like I said, 12 and a half to almost 17 and a half. His shooting percentage has actually come down. The guy is just a monster, okay? Oliver Bjorkstrand is a beast. And as long as he keeps his top power play, top line deployment, and is the guy, it seems like, in Columbus, I have all the faith in the world that he will continue to be good. I have no doubt in my mind that Oliver Bjorkstrand can be a beast. Now, one thing that I will say is take a look at your playoff schedule and take a look at uh, how your team is composed at the moment during your playoff weeks because Columbus doesn't have that great of a playoff schedule. So if you do add Bjorkstrand, what I would say, the one cautionary thing I'd give you is check your playoffs because Columbus doesn't have that great of a playoff schedule, and Bjorkstrand could become a long-term hold, and or could, I think he is a long-term hold, but you may not be able to fit him in, in which case it's going to be smarter for you to try to sell high um, or just sell in general and try to get someone that fits your playoff schedule a little bit better. So, Or just try to see, okay, maybe this player won't be relevant come playoff time. Eh, just kind of figure that out. I would. That's the one area of caution, I would say, with Bjorkstrand, is you want to take a look at um, what how he's going to fit into your playoff schedule. But other than that, to me, Oliver Bjorkstrand's the real deal and worth dropping guys like Atkinson for, maybe even a Kaloran, um, maybe Duclair, those kinds of guys, because 
I think Bjorkstrand is coming in red hot, and I don't really see him stopping anytime soon. So thank you for watching or for listening, and we will catch you on the next Hot Hands. Oh, we're going to be doing a special trade deadline and playoff prep episode uh, that's going to be coming out this weekend, so keep an eye out for that. And like I said, thanks for watching. Catch you next time.